Welcome to The Politocrat. I am Omar Moore. It is Tuesday, April the 27th, 2021. On this edition of The Politocrat, health, wealth, and insanity. More or less. I'll explain, I think right after this. These days there's so much going on. And Elton John is absolutely right. These days there are, there is, I should say, so much going on. And that was, by the way, Talking Old Soldiers. Talking Old Soldiers from Elton John. A great album from 1970, I believe, called Tumbleweed Connection. I remember that album. It, yeah, because I am that old. (laughs) That, (laughs) oh, you know, I just gleefully talk about how, and it's funny because they hate talking about age. If you talk to me in person, I, I will do everything not to answer that question. <laughs> but this is not about me, dear listener. I hope you're well. I really do. Um, Tumbleweed Connection is a really good album. That's really my whole point about that. And the reason why I played that little piece there where Elton sings, these days there's so much going on. That was He said that what? If my math puts me in the right frame of mind... On this episode, 50, 50 years ago, 51 years ago. And these days, there's so much going on still. Here we are in 2021. We've almost reached the end of April. Oh my goodness. Doesn't that make you feel old? Doesn't that make you feel, oh my God. Or whatever it makes you feel, dear listener. Here we are. We're almost at the end of the month. And soon, by the way, this Saturday soon, we will be at May 1st. What else can you do but laugh to keep from crying? But you don't even have to keep from crying. You just have to laugh at the speed at which this year is traveling by. I do hope, though, that this year has given you lemonade rather than lemons. Or more lemonade than lemons. I mean, you can't have the lemonade without the lemons, but you know what I mean. That there is some juice out of this year so far that you can actually drink that is not going to hurt you. I want to just take this time because there is so much going on in the world. But I want to take this time to talk a bit about health. And health is so important. And I'm going to get to vaccinations in a minute. But the first thing I want to talk about is your health. Now, I'm not a doctor. And if you are a doctor out there listening to me right now, first of all, thank you. Second of all, you can probably thank yours truly and any other podcaster who talks about health uh, for doing so. Because I, I really think that every single person who does a podcast on this planet should be doing this should be talking about health. It doesn't have to be anything in-depth. It doesn't have to be anything grandiloquent and marvelous. It just has to be that we remind each and every one of us listening to check our health, to get yourself checked, whether it's for a annual checkup, whether it's for, well, I don't really feel right, so I'm going to go to the doctor, Whether it's whatever it is, I really, really want you, dear listener, to go to the doctor, go in for a checkup, go in for a physical, go in for a stress test on your heart, go in for whatever it is, go in for a mammogram, go in for a COVID-19 test, go in for a vaccination from COVID-19, go in for getting your cholesterol checked, go in for whatever. But really, please, please, please go in and get your health checked. It's so important. 
And I really say this because our health is all we have. I mean, we have love, hopefully, uh, and support, hopefully. I hope that people do. Um, it's difficult for a lot of people because there are, there are a few people who don't. There are people in the world, quite a lot of people in the world, who don't have love and support of family members because those family members have cast them out of their homes, have excommunicated them, and excommunicated, excommun- gosh, if I could talk, and I can talk, but I'm tripping over my words. But there are families who have excommunicated fellow family members. The fellow family member comes out and says, Dear mother and father, I am gay, or dear mother and father, I am trans, or dear... And sometimes that is met with, we can't have you in the house anymore. And that is anywhere in the world. I'm talking to people all over the world, because people all over the world do, and I know this from looking at the, the records and things, do listen to this podcast. And I get messages from people from various parts of the world too. So look, I, it's not to show off or anything like that, it's just to say, this is a world premiere, as Kendrick Lamar would say. Although I've been at this radio now for more than just the 420 plus episodes consecutively that I've done. I've been been talking for years. <laughs> but the point is that some people have it really difficult. And they really that and that's why that's one of the reasons, well, among many other reasons why I'm not here. I am not going to go on social media and celebrate um publicly getting vaccinated. I, I just, Again, you know, I've talked about this before. If you are a regular listener, I've talked about this a million times. Um, but people have it really difficult out here. And I do think that we need to acknowledge that. And we also need to acknowledge that the world is a beautiful place and it's a cruel place at the same time. And we also need to acknowledge that love is the only way. Love and truth and education and good health are the ways forward, which is why I want to, again, emphasize the importance of getting a checkup. I've had listeners to this podcast tell me that they've done that and, you know, they are thankful for doing so. And things have come up for them that would not have been learned of if they didn't get checked. So please, I cannot stress enough. Please, I know some people, I know some of you don't like to go to the doctor, particularly if you're male. I know you don't want to go. You're afraid of what they might find. And that also happens for some females, some women as well. I know You're afraid of what they might find. I know, I know, I know. It's that dreaded thing, right? And you're talking, you're talking, you're listening to someone who is a freaking hypochondriac. (laughs) I will go to the doctor at the drop of a blooming hat. I mean, you know, because you can't play around with your health. And if you're a black man, and especially if you're a black woman, you cannot F around with your health. You cannot F around with your health. And if you're anybody, black, brown, Asian, white, native, whomever you are, you can't afford to do that with your health. Now, the other component of this, of course, is health care and health insurance. And if you are in most industrialized countries in the world, except for one, you will find that health care for you is basically a drop in the bucket. You're pretty much not having to pay anything, anything to get all of the things I've talked about. Checkups, mammograms, prostate health checks, all these kinds of things. But if you are in the United States of America, you know that health care costs a fortune, which is the insanity, Right. The health care costing you a good, good amount of money. 
and you've got to pay deductibles and you've got to do and if you don't have health care insurance oh god if you don't have health insurance in the united states of america you are fucked i i have to just say it for a fact i know i just said f a few moments ago but you're fucked if you don't have health your your life is pretty much ruined or over so please this is my invitation this is my safe well my opportunity now to say to those of you in the united states who don't have health insurance you have a chance now to get something that is somewhat affordable for you i think and i don't know what your financial situation is but i do know that affordable health care is better than no health care and i do think if you don't have regular health insurance right or if you don't have health insurance through your job which in the united states right this is how crazy and stupid the system is here and how oppressive it is most people have health care tied to their job which is just crazy in this country so if you lose your job you get fired you lose your health care it should never be ever tied to your job and that's just insane it's insane but here in the united states we do insane things we have a system that is very oppressive i think you've noticed that from afar and you don't have to tell people within the country of the united states just how oppressive the system is but all of this is to say for those people out there in the united states who are listening to me right now who do not have any health insurance whatsoever you can sign up now at healthcare.gov that's healthcare dot g o v and i believe you have until september but please do not wait until then i think it was initially you had until may i think the third week of may or something and i believe asterisk either side of the word believe that president biden extended that to september now i i need to go look that up again so i cannot guarantee and please don't hold me to it which in this case means If you don't have affordable health care at all, if you don't have any kind of health care, get your behinds, please, affectionately. Get your behinds over to healthcare.gov and sign up right now for health care. Affordable health care. Now, like the rest of us, if you've got health care tied to your job or if you've just got health care, and you know, I, you know, I don't know what I'd do without health insurance. You know, no matter where you have it, which vessel or vehicle you have health insurance from in the United States in particular, I don't know what I would do with that. What would you do without health insurance? Maybe you don't have health insurance. And maybe that's why you're not going to the doctor because that's what happens in the United States. So many hundreds of thousands of people die pretty much each year or thousands and thousands of people die each year. because they don't have health insurance in this country and i think it may even be millions again i don't want to be held to exact numbers but many thousands of people die every year in the united states simply because they do not have health insurance and that's one of the biggest reasons why people do not go to the doctor why because they know they're going to have to pay an arm and a blooming leg and if they have to go to the emergency room wo nelly it's a lot of money if you have to go there and you don't have health care insurance because then you have health insurance and you see the bill anyway and that can be eye opening depending on you know who you are and what your financial ability is but still still if you don't have health insurance ooh I mean some people literally how many times have we heard of people refusing treatment and oh they got seriously injured in an accident but they refused treatment The reason they're refusing treatment as you know dear listener is because they don't have health insurance it's not that they're afraid in that case in my view what the doctors might find it's because they don't have the ability to pay because they are not millionaires and because the healthcare system in this country is a complete racket It's totally a racket. It's all about maximizing your stay in hospital so that they can bill you up the wazoo for a piece of tape, for a piece of this, for a glove, for a, a band-aid. I mean, seriously. 
But I think I'm venturing a little farther afield than I want to. My whole focus of this particular block is to get you to get checked. It's such an important thing. I cannot stress enough heart health. So many millions of people around the world die each year of heart disease. It's one of the biggest killers of people on the planet. It's one of the top two or three killers of people in the country and on the globe. This is not something to play about with, dear listener. And in these stressful times, with these nerve-wracking times and all that's going on, as Elton John said, there's so much going on, right? One of the things that you have to make your priority, dear listener, is your health. I cannot stress that enough to you. Your health is everything. Whether it's your mental health, whether it's your physical health, you have to deal with with health. And I dare say, and pardon me, I dare say that there are people listening to me who are going through some struggles with health. And I do wish each and every one of you all of the very best and the support and good wishes and prayers from me to you as you deal with some of the health challenges that you may well be dealing with this with right now. So I do want to say that please get checked. Heart health is so important. Get a stress test. Get a physical. Feel for any lumps in your breasts, any lumps in your testicles. I'm serious. This is not something to be uncomfortable about for those of you who may be laughing or giggling there in the back row. This is about you and your health. And that's something we don't talk about enough or we definitely don't talk about mental health. And again, I have failed you on something here. Not again, I shouldn't say it like that. But I have failed you here um, because I have been telling you for the better part of what, five months now? Oh, it's so embarrassing. How dare I? tease you like this and say we're going to have a mental health person come in and I'm still not giving up on that I'm still not giving up on that so um, that will happen I, I just want it to happen I should stop saying it's going to happen and I should just spring it upon you so that you that you uh, avail yourselves of, of the guests that, that will come um, hopefully in the year 2021 um, but it's just yeah, it's something that, that has to be done and will be done but what has to be done even more so than that is for you to go and get checked, please. Again, I've had people contact me saying that they have been they had been struggling with whether to go and get checked, whether to go to the doctor, whether to go for a checkup. And then they decided to do so and they were thankful for it because they found things, right? And that's the thing about getting checked is that when you go, right, whatever you find, at least you know. So then you're in a position to make decisions. Then you are empowered. So I want you today, and this is not the last time I'm going to be saying this. I want you to empower yourself and empower your health. And that's how you do it. If you empower your health, you empower yourself. I'm telling you, this is something that means so much to me. I really do care about you listening to this. And I care that you listen to this podcast because I keep telling you, I am greatly appreciative. I really am. And uh, I need to do a, another giveaway. I know I'm doing a giveaway on the... Uh, um, I Am Not Your Negro DVD and Blu-ray, which is coming. That's coming for those subscribers to the uh, newsletter. But I, I do I, I do plan to do a giveaway somewhere down the line. 
uh, you know, in general to people to say thank you for listening to this podcast. Um, of course, there is the uh, Politocrat Daily Podcast online store, which I am so thankful that people are patronizing. I hope you are too. And don't forget, you can visit the dash politocrat dot my shopify dot com to do just that. It would be greatly appreciated. People are uh, going to the store and purchasing, and I'm really thankful and grateful that you are. So thank you. But I really want more of you to do so. so those of you out there who haven't yet purchased something, and you know who you are, please do so. Visit the dash politocrat dot my shopify. Dot com. But I really do want you to empower yourself by empowering your health. And the way you do that is to go and get a checkup today. Go and schedule a doctor's appointment. If you don't have a doctor, you'll have to do a walk-in, I guess, or whatever. In this healthcare system, there's all kinds, in the United States at least, there's all kinds of things. I think in the NHS the same way. But please, please get to a point where you are checking yourself, getting yourself checked. Know your body. Know how it works. I mean, honestly, I'm not trying to be silly here. I, I'm not referring to our bodies ourselves. That's not what I mean. Right? That book. Remember that book, Our Bodies Ourselves? I'm, I'm not talking about that. When I, I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm talking about getting to know your body. Right? How it feels. Where you're healthy. Where you may not be as healthy. What kinds of things you are doing in your life that either helps to improve your health or not improve it, make it worse. Be cognizant of your body and and health. You have to be at a point, dear listener, whomever you may be, that you are fully knowing or in full knowledge of how your body reacts under certain circumstances and also what things are going on in your body so please 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 your health is so important as you know this is something that is so important you cannot afford to turn your back on your health because if you turn your back on your health you are literally turning your back on your life Welcome back. Uh, look, there's, there's um, a few other things. Gosh, there's so much going on. I mean, that's why I played that uh, tune, Talking Old Soldiers from Elton John's Tumbleweed album at the beginning of that first block, because there really is so much going on. It's really hard to keep up with all the news events and everything else that, that that's on the plate. Um, I'm sure in your lives too, you know, you very busy lives that you lead. And it's very difficult to keep up with everything. Um, but you, the, what I aim to do here is to try to get you as much of the news that you may have missed um, as possible within a reasonable amount of time on a podcast episode. Um, I should start with this. Look, the, there is um, this phenomenal, uh, again, to keep with health here for a few more minutes, um, President Biden here in the United States has uh, achieved this goal of over two of two hundred million uh, vaccination shots, and he's had to revise the goal because it, the the initial goal was I want one hundred thousand one hundred million excuse me shots in people's arms, a hundred million shots by the one hundredth day of office which would be April the 29th, 2021. And as you know, on the calendar, we are still two days away from that. And not only has there been 100 million shots in the United States of vaccine in people's arms, there has been now over 200 million shots in people's arms in the United States. And some, I guess it's about 30 odd percent of people or more than that have been fully vaccinated already in the United States. 
That means they've got two of the shots. That's just really great news. I don't know about you, but I think that's great news. I really do. I think that's fantastic news. Fantastic news. So congratulations to President Biden. Um, He takes a lot of credit here. He should. And also for those states, governors who have got this vaccine out there. But here's my thing now. I'm going to turn away from that. By the way, President Biden will be giving his first address to a joint session of Congress. It will not be called the State of the Union Address because typically when a president here in the United States takes office in so far as been he, his first term, the very first year in office of his first term is usually a joint session. It's not called the State of the Union because the person in office in their first union, you know, in their first address hasn't been in office long enough. So it's not going to be called a State of the Union address. It will be called an address to the joint session of Congress, which in fact is what a State of the Union address is, but it's just not going to be called that. I hope I'm not confusing you. Tomorrow, April 28th, at 6 p.m. Pacific U.S. time, 9 p.m. Eastern U.S. time, which would be 2 a.m. on Thursday, my goodness, UK time, and 3 a.m. Thursday, (laughs) Paris time, and I think Spain, you know, Barcelona time, and I think there's an issue with the time zones in Spain, Um, it may be a, anyway, But the point is, is that, look, tomorrow, April 28th, is President Biden's address to the Joint Session of Congress, and it will be available at White House uh, wh.gov live, wh.gov forward slash live, and uh, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and everywhere else, um, at the White, at White House, or at POTUS. You can watch it there too. So anyway, and anyway, and if you don't see it live, you'll get to watch it, obviously, if you choose to do so. That's going to be a very interesting address. Very interesting. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but I want to turn away from that and pivot to something else here. Because while yours truly has just thanked and praised President Biden and all of, the, all of that, right? There are countries on this planet who are not getting this vaccine. And this is what I've been talking about and mentioning for a number of episodes now. And one of the reasons that, yet again, yet another reason why I will not be going on social media and posting, oh, I got my vaccine. You know how I feel about this, dear listener. I'm not going to do that. You know, And it's not that I'm taking... And listen, it doesn't make me morally superior to anybody This is just me. This is a podcast that I happen to run and host and speak on, of course. So I'm going to express these thoughts and feelings about the way I see the world. Right? So, again, this is another reason why I won't post social media photos or, or any kind of photos about, oh, I got a vaccine. Because there's people now in India and in Brazil and in a number of countries on the African continent who aren't getting this vaccine. They're not even getting oxygen. Speaking of people not being able to breathe, they're not getting any oxygen. It's a whole battle in India. 1.5 billion people. And they're absolutely in bang on trouble. They're bang on in trouble, they are. It's serious stuff. The African continent. You got people dying. You got a civil war up there in uh, Ethiopia, in Tigray. Human rights violations happening every day. I mean, again, people can celebrate because there's not been a lot to celebrate these last 15 months. I just think that Again, I think in some ways, it's again, there's something very American about this, right? Because I don't know that every other country in the world 
has people in it who are going, I got vaccinated, woohoo. I mean, obviously there's some, but we seem to do that so much, right? We'll get, we'll do that and get ourselves put into social media law. And I get it again that some people are doing this with an eye toward educating people and all that. But my whole thing is tell them to get vaccinated, right? Um, I get it. You want to show them so that they can say, oh, it, if if she's getting it or if he's getting it or if they're getting it, it must be okay for me. I get it. So that's why people, some people are doing that. But my whole thing is get vaccinated, get educated, get educated, get vaccinated. I really, I was so heartened that one of the things that Twitter has done, and it may be true on other social media, but one of the things that Twitter has done is they had a whole thread of information over the last two or three months posting about education, what these vaccines do, what the side effects are, can pregnant women get the vaccine, should they, what about kids? It was comprehensive. Oh my gosh, the the link to that I have shared on my Twitter account at the popcorn, R-E-E-L. But I will also do this for the newsletter. Oh my God, the newsletter. I, 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 I will do that. I will put that in there because it's really important. There's all kinds of garbage being thrown around on social media that ain't true. That's coming from these vicious, evil, anti-vax garbage people who, and I call them garbage people because that's what they are. They're peddling garbage and they are garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. You cannot have this kind of thing, and you've got this information being thrown into black and brown communities. And black and brown people, some of those persons, are believing this crap. It's very, very dangerous. As are some white people believing in this crap. But as I congratulate President Biden and those around him for a really outstanding achievement, And he should take the victory lap lap about this. He's going to be giving updates if he hasn't already done so today about COVID. I'm sure he will talk about it certainly in the address tomorrow before the joint session of Congress. But as he takes that victory lap, the rest of the world is not so fortunate to be able to take that victory lap with him. Because as I've been saying to you, poorer countries are suffering and they are not getting this vaccine. And as I've said before, the United States of America and the United Kingdom are, in my view, stockpiling this vaccine. You've got situations where in Louisiana and in Mississippi and in other states, there's more vaccine there than they know what to do with. And people are literally not going to get vaccinated. There was a New York Times story yesterday about people not going in for their second shot of vaccine. So if you got Moderna or if you got Pfizer, there's about 8 to 10% of the people who are not coming back for the second shot. Say why? Why wouldn't you come back for a second shot? And the article goes into this also for the newsletter. It's just unreal. Now, I don't want to make it seem as if, oh my God, there's an epidemic of people because of course, as the news is wont to do, it will highlight the small, relatively small percentage of people who are not doing something versus the vast majority of people who are doing something. Remember just a few, maybe a week or so ago, I championed New Mexico, the state of New Mexico, very proudly. Even though I'm not from New Mexico, it doesn't matter if I am or not. But very proudly I've been there. It's a lovely state. Because New Mexico, in the same New York Times, was reported as being the state with the most vaccinated people in the entire country. The most fully vaccinated people, except for New Hampshire, I believe it was. And the most vaccinated people overall from New Mexico. Of the new states, New Mexico... Of any state in the country, New Mexico is the one with the most vaccinated people. But then you've got these states who, whether they're in the South or whether they're anywhere else, 
who they can't give the vaccine away. And meanwhile, you've got these countries all over the world who have been made poor by colonialism. Let's not forget that because they, you know, there's a lot of these articles that are out here going, oh, well, these poor nations, oh, they're so poor. Like they just were born poor. No, they weren't. They were colonized by the British and they were invaded and colonized by Americans. Come on. Come on now. Let's put all of this on the table and be honest with ourselves. It's like that term vaccine hesitancy, which is such a poor term. Let's get real. There's reasons why people don't want to take the vaccine and there's reasons why people are wondering but it's got nothing to do with ooh they're hesitant they're shy ooh they're shy no there's real reasons right and there's historic and governmental reasons and oppressiveness and violence against black bodies and brown bodies and native bodies and so there's yeah people are going to look around and go well you know you guys have done experiments on us for well over a hundred plus years now and We're not so sure that we want to participate because this could be another one of them. That's not vaccine hesitancy. That's historical awareness. So let's just get that right, shall we? To that end, you know, Laura Spinney, Laura spelt the common way and Spinney spelt the way you might think it's spelt with the word spin and then N-E-Y on the end of it, has written an opinion story, as I call them, in The Guardian. And it is dated today, 27th of April, 2021, a Tuesday. And the headline on it is, Rich countries close their eyes to the global COVID surge at their own peril. And the subtitle is The Pandemic's Death Toll is Now Being Felt Most Gravely in Developing Nations. This virus is not done yet. Now, this is something that you really do need to pay attention to. And um, I should add that Laura Spinney is a science journalist. Let me say that again. Laura Spinney is a science journalist and author. Her most recent book is Pale Rider the Spanish flu of 1918, and how it changed the world. And it's interesting, by the way, because the so-called Spanish flu did not begin in Spain. It really should be called the Kansas flu, because that's where it began, in Kansas, Missouri. So, please... Or I should say in Kansas, the state, pardon me. It's not necessarily Kansas City, Missouri, but it began in Kansas, in the state of Kansas. That's where this flu, this flu pandemic in 1918 began in Kansas. So why it's called Spanish flu, and there's a whole reason behind that and the war and all that, but that is not a good enough reason. It didn't begin there, right? It began in Kansas and Last time I checked my history and my knowledge and my memory. No one was beating up people from Kansas and saying, it's all your fault. They weren't doing that back in 1918 and 1919. And they weren't killing people from Kansas. They didn't come up to them and ask them, well, where are you from? And the person said Kansas. And then they were beaten up or killed. That was not how it went down in 1918 and 1919. And I don't have to have been alive 102 or 103 years ago to know that. So Laura Spinney did this story, this opinion story. And this is really horrifying. Sorry, but this is stuff you need to know. Because, you know, the media in the United States, forget it. They are hardly covering this. At all. Surprise, surprise. If this happened in New York City, as it did, you would have wall-to-wall coverage. You'd have that despicable governor, Andrew Cuomo, from New York State, all over your TVs, 
here in the United States. Isn't it amazing or not amazing how now you cannot, you know, this guy is such a piece of garbage. You know, he has obviously harassed women. He has been, you know, is it, if I call, listen, that's violence against women. As far as I'm concerned, what Cuomo has done, he has violated women. He's violated their space. He's violated their well-being. He's violated their existence. That's what I think about Cuomo. He's disgusting. And by the way, let me just say this before I get to Laura Spinney's story. New Yorkers should be recalling Andrew Cuomo to the extent that the law allows in the Empire State. New Yorkers should be recalling Democratic Governor Andrew Cuomo. This guy has been a disaster for your state. I used to live in your state, and I'm telling you, and I love New York, that guy has been a disaster. Get rid. He is not going to resign, and he would have done so if he had any respect for himself and for those women. But why would he, be, why would he have respected the women that he abused? Why would he have done that, right? Because this guy's a piece of garbage. And he's arrogant. And power fuels even more of that arrogance. And this notion of, I'm an untouchable. I'm an <laughs> untouchable. I'm just thinking about the movie um, with Omar C. You know? I'm an untouchable. I'm an untouchable. I can do what I want. Arrogant son of a unit. St- arrogant. I tell you, still in office. If he had any dignity at all, he'd resign. He'd resign. Is that he's sparring with reporters? This guy is an arrogant so and so. You know that, as well as a serial predator. This guy is horrible. And it seems to me that there's less outrage at Governor Cuomo than there is. Against Harvey Weinstein. I don't think it should be based on. Well Harvey Weinstein did all of these other things. I don't think that should be the basis. Of why the outrage is different. I think we should all have. The same kind of outrage. At Governor Cuomo. Governor Cuomo. Affects the lives. Of millions of people. In a state. Harvey Weinstein really doesn't. He affects a few hundred careers. In a small ecosystem that is a bubble called Hollywood, right? He affects that small ecosystem of a small group of people in a segment of the economic ladder, right? So as to be top 1 to 10 to top 10%. Whereas Governor Andrew Cuomo affects the lives of millions of people and all over the economic spectrum, many of or most of them being poor people. And this guy has such contempt for the poor. He has such contempt for black folks. He has such contempt for brown folks. He has such contempt for women. Isn't that obvious? I've been telling you that for the last five minutes. He's got to go. And Californians should not be wasting their time recalling Gavin Newsom. That is a recall that is a waste of taxpayer money. And as many issues as I've had, or a few, with Governor Newsom, he is still doing a relatively good job in this state. I mean, you've heard me complain about some of the things that he's done with this pandemic and some other things, but I'm telling you, he's still doing a better job. Um, Even with those things said, he is still doing a better job um, as governor than A, his predecessor, and B, than Cuomo. And Cuomo's the one, and I don't know what New York law says about this and what has to happen, but Cuomo is the one who should be getting recalled or facing a recall election, not Gavin Newsom. I think it's quite comical that Gavin Newsom is facing this recall election. It's a total waste of taxpayer money. It really is. 
You've got four or five Republicans running against them. This is not 2003, as I've said before. Gray Davis was not the most popular governor in this, country, in this, in this state. The Democratic uh, da- Gray Davis. He was not the Democratic governor, da- Gray Davis. Can't even talk again. He was not the most popular governor. And fairly inept at times. And that led to his recall. Over 100 people ran against him in the recall race, including Arnold Schwarzenegger. And when you have over 100 people um, running against you, the chances of you winning that recall are pretty darn slim because they're going to all take from your percentage. They are. They're going to affect that. The less people you have running against you, the better chances you have of success. And then when you've got Arnold Schwarzenegger in there, which is who ended up winning the recall 18 years ago, 2003. And he didn't do this great job as governor. I mean, he was at the nurses' throats all the time. He was not a friend to the health industry, uh, at least not the workers in it. Maybe the billionaires he was, but not to the workers. And the nurses' unions did not like him, and he didn't like them. He showed his contempt to them. He basically said, hasta la vista, baby, to all of them. And plus, he was the gropinator. Like Cuomo, you know, the gropinator. They called him the governator, but women and persons like myself who really have no tolerance at all for this kind of toxic masculinity or any kind, all called him gropinator. And it, I know it's kind of you're making fun, but I wasn't making fun. I meant that as this guy is disgusting. And so, you know, now Arnold Schwarzenegger now is being fondly looked at. See, this lens by which these these abusers suddenly get looked at differently now. And I'm guilty of it. I've been retweeting some of the, the better things that Arnold has said over the last couple of years. But that doesn't take away the fact from the fact that he would grope women and that many women have come forward and talked about it or said it. And Lord knows Maria Shriver could write a book or two. In fact, she has. But... Come on. I mean, I know I digress here. But Laura Spinney's story, as I get back to that, Laura Spinney's story is one you should read. Rich countries close their eyes to the global COVID surge at their own peril. Is there one pandemic or two? That was a question being asked a year ago when wealthy countries accounting for only 15% of the global population had 80% of the COVID deaths. Could it be that the rich world was more vulnerable somehow because its populations were older or more individualistic or had forgotten to be scared of infectious disease? I'm going to skip forward here. Last week saw more than 5.8 million new cases of COVID globally, the highest number yet. More than 3 million people have now died from COVID according to the World Health Organization, WHO which also reports that infections and hospitalizations hospitalizations in those aged 25 to 59 are increasing at an alarming rate. Quote, it took nine months to reach one million deaths, four months to reach two million, and three months to reach three million. WHO Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus said last week. I mean, this is something that, did you know that? Did you know that it's taken only three months to reach another one million people? Did you know that? And because the, because the, the, if you're in the United States, you would not have known that. I'm sure you wouldn't have without reading an article like this or without staying on top of this. And in the UK, you probably wouldn't have heard this either. May you may have done. I didn't know this until I just read this. It's taken only three months to reach another one million people dead. And the reason why I think you're not hearing about this, certainly in the U.S., is because, oh, we're so special. We're all getting vaccinated, or some of us are not. And we're too busy cheerleading and celebrating over here. But yet we're less than 5% of the population of the planet. And over 90% of the planet has not even been vaccinated at all yet. So it's kind of a hollow victory to celebrate Very importantly, though, your vaccination on social media and and cheerlead it and go, oh, look at me. I got my vaccine. 
and then 90% of the planet doesn't have a single shat. That's really great to be so isolationist when you've got India, people dying by the hundreds of thousands. I mean, they're dying close to 4,000 people a day in India. But you are trained not to care about anywhere else but where you live. Literally where you live. On the street where you live. I mean, it's just really crazy how we do that. And the media's done that to us. It's done it to you. Where all you think about is just your block or your city or your country, barely. Don't even know what's going on around you sometimes. Not you personally. I'm, t- I'm speaking you generally. That This is a really scary thing. The sharpest upticks in recent years have been in South East Asia, driven in large part by India and the East Mediterranean and Western Pacific regions. But the situation is also very bad in Latin America. And I mentioned Brazil earlier, didn't I? I've been mentioning Brazil briefly in mention over the last, well, week or so, on and off. People who might, this is Laura Spinney's article I'm reading from her opinion story. People who migrated to Brazil in search of work are now reported to be fleeing the humanitarian catastrophe that is unfolding there. Infection rates are still high in many wealthy countries, including the US and much of Europe, but the mood is more upbeat. As vaccines roll out, many people feel the worst is behind them. Many US states, some US states rather, have rashly lifted their mask mandates. The British government gave the most optimistic signal it could think of earlier this month when it reopened pubs. Great going, my native country. Really great. Well done. Congratulations. You are so special and you're so smart. You know, open up pubs again. What could possibly go wrong? You got less than half the country fully vaccinated. Really great. That's a great move. And by the way, England and the UK in general has been very good in terms of getting vaccinated. Their programs have been excellent. I'm not knocking that. But I am knocking these rash decisions to open up pubs. Really? Not even open air pubs, but indoor pubs you've opened? And I heard a report on Sky last week or two ago that said that Boris Johnson, what an ass clown he is. Oh, God. The elections are just over a week away those of you who can vote in them in the UK. Boris Johnson has said, well, our goal is to reopen the entire country with no mask mandates. Or some people have been saying this in June. So on on June 21st is the exact date they are still, to the best of my knowledge, still striving for, to have no mask restriction. So you can go anywhere you want, no masks. Don't worry about physical distancing anymore. That's what the plan is for June the 21st. We are nowhere near. It's just madness. Here in California, Gavin Newsom, the governor, is saying, oh, we're looking to open up in June. That's, I'm sorry, we can't afford that. There are people who don't want to get this vaccine, right? We still don't have close to half, we don't have 40% of the the people in San Francisco even fully vaccinated yet. Less than 40% in one city in California. And the governor wants to open up the entire entire state in June. It's It's only a month away, June. A month and four days. And it's just madness. But look, And COVID, this is back to Laura Spinney, and COVID-19 is slipping down the headlines, reflecting not just fatigue at having to respect the rules, but fatigue at the very mention of the disease. Fear concentrates the mind, but fear is dissipating. We'd rather read about Tory Slees, Boris Johnson, or the doomed European Super League. You have got to read the rest of this. I'm going to put this in the newsletter. I will. You've got to read this. You've got to read this this opinion story by Laura Spinney. It's in The Guardian today, 
Tuesday, October, October, Tuesday, April, yeah, maybe you wish it was October, Tuesday, April the 27th, 2021, it's entitled, it's in the Guardian, it's entitled, Rich Countries Close Their Eyes to the Global COVID Surge at Their Own Peril. Laura Spinney, S-P-I-N-N-E-Y, S-P-I-N-N-E-Y, Laura, L-A-U-R-A. This is a really good story. You've got to read this. Really, it's very good. And it's all about some of the things that I've been saying, by the way, which is that we are turning our backs on this now. And the US and the UK are absolutely now, you know, they've got this vaccine and people are cavalier. And the whole thing now is basically get back to normal, get back to normal. Let's get back to normal again. Let's see what we can do to get back to while the rest of the world is anywhere but back to so-called normal. They're just going, they're just really at the brunt of this virus now. And the rest of us in this here country and in the UK, we turn our backs. Turn our backs on it all. Opening up pubs, open up the bars, opening up this and that restaurant and the other. I saw people dining in a restaurant yesterday. And I'm not so sure that you're supposed to be even doing that right now in San Francisco. Dining indoors? Really? I don't think that you're supposed to be doing that here. I should be contacting the... I should ask the Department of Health here in San Francisco whether you should... Because I don't think you're supposed... But I honestly, I was walking. I peeked in. I saw people in there eating. That is not a good look. And I don't care that people have been vaccinated. You can't be in a doors, indoors in a restaurant eating. Really, you shouldn't be outside eating either. Listen... But, you know, can't completely choke the world. You can't, geez, you can't completely deprive the American world of its food outdoors now. By the way, very important article. You've got to read that. Also, this article that I want you to look at is called Big Shortfall in COVAX COVID Vaccine Sharing Scheme. That is something I've been talking about, too. I've been mentioning COVAX on and off here. And a few months ago, I had uh, Professor Beata Campman on, uh, and she mentioned COVAX as well. And I and, and she talked about the job that COVAX was doing. And I said, yeah, COVAX has been doing some good things, and I'm aware of them. But what's happening now since that, you know, that was two months ago, I think I had uh, Professor Campman on. But since that time, we're now learning, as of now in April, late April now, that there have been some shortfalls in this sharing scheme. Surprise, surprise. And that it ain't going to the poor countries that need to have this vaccine. And that's got to stop. We've got to get more of the so-called poor countries. I will not call them developing. They are very, they were well developed before the US and the UK destroyed them, thank you very much, and plundered them, thank you very much, and colonized them, thank you very much, no thank you. So, look, that that article needs to be read as well. And it's so important. Also from The Guardian. By the way, there's also a website uh, from the Ad Council that is urging people, urging them to get the answers, get educated about your health, get vaccineanswers.org. Um, really, these are really important. Also, visit the CDC's website as well. Really important information. And you can trust the CDC now. But really important information. By the way, that revealed big shortfall um, in this COVAX COVID vaccine sharing scheme. This actually was an article from the 22nd of April. So it was five days ago now. Michael Safi and Ashley Kirk. Only a fifth of Oxford AstraZeneca doses expected by May are delivered. As export bans, hoarding, and supply shortages bite. So this is really important. So only 20%. I mean, this is really a problem. And we know that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been an issue. Um, not a major issue, but for those, you know, five or six or ten people who have got blood clots, it's a major issue for them. Um, but overall, um, it's still being applied not being applied in Denmark, they have banned it. Not being applied here because it's not even been looked at here in the United States. It is still going off in the UK. UK has is using it. 
And by the way, the United States has restarted the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, otherwise known as the Janssen vaccine, after blood clots there. There was actually a case here in the San Francisco Bay Area of a man in his 30s who got blood clots, who is now recovering, I should say, add. Please read these two articles, the one from Laura Spinney and then the opinion story from her, and then this actual um, non-opinion story, um, which is an actual news story, I should say. It's called Revealed, Big Shortfall in COVAX COVID Vaccine Sharing Scheme by Michael Safi and Ashley Kirk. Also, that will be in the newsletters from The Guardian, April 22nd. I'll be right back. Welcome back. So here's some significant news that you may not have learned. Yesterday, the Inquiry Commission at inquirycommission.org put out a report, a 188-page report. It may have been, in fact, further back than yesterday. Um, in fact, it was. <laughs> this is a report dated March 2021. So obviously, it was further back. And it was done by the National Conference of Black Lawyers, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, and the National Lawyers Guild. So this is an international report. And the commissioners are from all over the world, from Barbados, India, South Africa, France, Costa Rica, the UK, Pakistan, South Africa, Japan, Antigua, and Barbuda, Jamaica, and Nigeria. And so all of them put out this report. They authored this report, this 188-page report, which I urge you to read or go through, And it's called the Report of the International Commission of Inquiry on Systemic Racist Police Violence Against People of African Descent in the United States. This you must read. Oh, my God. This is and it is dated March 2021. So you really should read this. I'm going to put this in the newsletter, too. Um, I promise that this is this is the promise that I will deliver on, actually. Um, this inquiry was really good. This this is a a one hundred and eighty eight page report, and they concluded that these were crimes against humanity. And I've said this before myself, dear listener, that these crimes, these murders of us, us, is are crimes against humanity. They really are. These are human rights violations, obviously. But they are crimes against humanity. And quite frankly, these cops should be brought and these police departments should be brought before the world court, before the Hague. I'm telling you, in the Netherlands, put them in the Hague. I'm dead serious. Because this shooting of murder of Andrew Brown Jr., oh my God. The press conference happened today, I think the police, but yesterday, the family... Oh, my goodness me. They murdered this guy. They absolutely murked and executed Andrew Brown Jr., who, according to his family and lawyers, had his hands on the steering wheel when the police opened fire on him. They told him to put his hands on the steering wheel. He did. And they came up to him and they pumped him with bullets. And his hands were still on the steering wheel. And he died. He was murdered, executed by these cops. In Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And now they all, oh, they're boarding up everywhere. Everywhere in Elizabeth City is boarded up now. So you militarize your police. You further hyper militarize your your police in your city when you're boarded up like it's a blooming war zone. A war zone that your system created. And then you tell the people, it's a state of emergency. You're the blooming state of emergency, mate. And this report backs me up on that. This report says so, that you're the state of emergency. These police departments are the state of emergency. You're the blooming emergency, mate. You're the ones. And you've got black folk being murdered out here every day. And and most of them aren't even covered. Many of them aren't on video. And some of them that are on video don't get to see the news light of day. That's how it is now. Murdering black folk in this country, the cops murdering black folk, the state murdering black folks, 
That's become passe. That's become totally passe in the United States and has for decades. I mean, honestly, with the exception of the world, protesting and demonstrating around the execution of George Floyd, this whole evil of murdering black people has become passe. It's oh, past a great poupon, another black person murdered by the cops. I mean, this Andrew Brown Jr. situation, that was an execution. We we barely had a week ago today, a week ago. Was it yesterday? Was it a week ago today? Is it Tuesday or was it last Wednesday? I forget. It was last Tuesday, a week ago today, that Derek Chauvin was found guilty on all charges. And that same day, Makia Bryant was murdered by the police. Then we heard, of course, before that, of Dante Wright. And we heard about Adam Toledo from March of this year. And we heard about... I go on and on. Andrew Brown Jr. It's horrible. To say it's horrible doesn't really fit the bill, does it, though? And this report from the Inquiry Commission of these groups concluded that this, these were human rights violations, but crimes against humanity. It's a really detailed report about excessive force, lethal violence, mental health crises, systemic violence. I mean, this is it's just incredibly detailed. And again, the report is called Report of the International Commission of Inquiry on Systemic Racist Police Violence Against People of African Descent in the United States, March 2021. It's a really good report. It really is. And one of the people on that report I know of, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles of Barbados. I know who that is. I know who that is. I, I know. I think there's someone else on here whose name I recognize as well. This is just, you know, you've got to read this. This is, and it's not getting covered. It's not getting any coverage in the corporate news media. They're not covering. Did you know about this? If you're a CNN watcher, if you are an MB, NBC or MSNBC watcher, an ABC watcher, or if you watch Fox, well, Fox, forget it. Fox is a disaster. It's, it's not even news. Did you know about this? If you watched those channels, was it covered? I bet you it wasn't. Did Don Lemon cover it? No. Did Chris Cuomo cover it? No. Did anybody, Anderson Cooper, did he cover it? No. Tell me where someone covered this. Maybe Roland Martin covered it, but he's not the corporate news media. He's black, independent, owned media. Black, owned, independent media. And he may have covered it. I don't know if he did. But this is really important. Really important. I'll be right back. Oh my goodness, here we go again, you know, here we go again. In in this uh, break that I just took, it was, you know, this interlude, very short, I, I just come across another story of a black man killed. No, actually, he is in int- intensive care, excuse me. <laughs> Isaiah Brown, 32 years of age, was in intensive care with 10 bullet wounds following the shooting outside a home in Spotsylvania County early on Wednesday, WRC-TV reported. This is dated Saturday, April 24th, what I'm reading from. It, It appeared in the Associated Press, but it's reproduced here in The Guardian. TheGuardian.com. Virginia deputy who shot black man appears to... This is the headline. Virginia deputy who who shot black man, appears to mistake phone for gun. Body camera footage and 911 audio released after sheriff's deputy reportedly shoots Isaiah Brown, repeatedly shoots Isaiah Brown. So wait a minute. You see, they always, these cops, these white cops, white male cops in particular, always mistake what a black person has in their hand or doesn't have, right? Right? So is it that they need eye tests 
Or is it that these people are racist and a system backs them? And a system protects them? And a system says, it's okay, you can shoot, we won't even ask the questions later. After all, like that deputy said in Cobb County in Georgia five years ago. Remember, we only kill black people. That's what he said to a white woman who had been pulled over in the dead of night in Cobb County, Georgia. Who was scared. She was afraid. And this white male sheriff, uh, cop, deputy or whatever the heck he was, said to her, don't worry, remember, we only kill black people. Yeah, well, there you go. He admits to what is obvious to all of us is that it's only black people and brown people getting killed out here by these cops. Oh, you mistook his cordless house phone? Listen to this. I'm going to read this to you for just a few moments of this. Body camera footage and 911 audio released late on Friday appeared to show. This is Friday of last, this past Friday. That a Virginia deputy mistook a cordless house phone held by a black man for a gun before shooting him repeatedly. Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. How many people hold a gun to their head as if they're talking to it? Do you, when you have, if you have a firearm... Do you talk into it as if it is your phone? So how in in the fuck is a cop thinking that someone talking into a house phone or holding it is somehow holding a gun? Don't they give you sight tests in Virginia? As a cop, don't you get all that? It is evident, quote, that the tragic shooting of Isaiah Brown was completely avoidable. No shit, Brown's attorney David Haynes said. No shit. Of course it's completely avoidable. These cops are completely avoidable. And they really should be avoiding being in uniform. And they should avoid being in the police forces. And the system's got to get rid of them. But the system ain't going to do that. They reward them with new jobs. Two towns over. Two precincts over. The body camera video shows the deputy yelling at Brown to show his hands. The deputy then yells, quote, drop the gun, end quote, multiple times and appears to say over his radio, quote, he's got a gun to his head. So you didn't even shout out, what is that in your hand? The deputy then yells, stop walking towards me. Stop walking towards me. Stop, stop, stop before firing at least seven shots. The 911 audio shows that Isaiah Brown, who was shot 10 times, was on the phone with a dispatcher at the time. The dispatcher is heard telling Brown to, quote, hold your hands up as the sirens draw near. I mean, look, the AP is a good um, source, but I, I really hate the way they write their stories because they do twist them, like all media seem to, in the favor of these cops. And you have to really pass out the language. And um, at this moment, I don't have the time to do that. I, I will. I would love to do it at subsequent at subsequent time. Um, But this is just, again, this is insanity. And that's what that report I referred you to earlier, the Inquiry Commission report, is talking about. This systemic behavior that is crime against humanity. It's a crime against humanity. It's just really evil. Andrew Brown, autopsy shows he was shot five times. Andrew Brown Jr., Five times 
independent pathologist hired by Brown's family examined his body and noted one wound to the head. I started to watch that video and I stopped. It takes place at night. He's in his car, is Andrew Brown Jr. He's got his hands on the steering wheel. And, and, and from what I know, they blew him away, according to his parents and his family. I'm, I'm telling you, it's an execution. Bakari Sellers, by the way, who I've spoken to on this podcast, spoke to him almost a year ago now. is an attorney um, in this case for the family, or he certainly is, uh, yeah, on behalf of the family, along with Benjamin Crump. Quote, this is what Bakari Sellers said. Quote, we have an execution here in Elizabeth City. We demand justice. We demand justice for Andrew Brown and his family. You don't have to be black. You don't have to be white. You just have to have a beating heart to understand that injustice was done. Another lawyer Chantel Sherry Lasseter said, quote, this is painful for his family and this community. This was an execution, an assassination of this unarmed black man. And by the way, the lawyers have said that they've only shown a clip, a snippet of this from the body camera. They've not shown everything. The snippet that they were shown, the family, the attorney said yesterday at the press conference, and there was one today, I think, held by the police. But at yesterday's press conference, for the attorney, for the families uh, of Andrew Brown Jr., the attorney said that the snippet that they were allowed to see showed Brown, who was 42, with his hands on the steering wheel of the car he was driving when he was shot dead in the hail of police bullets. They assassinated this brother. Quote, my dad got executed just trying to save his own life, Khalil Farabee. Brown's son told that briefing, quote, it's messed up how this happened. It ain't right. It ain't right at all. And just today, that was yesterday that Farabee said this. And Farabee is the son of Andrew Brown Jr. And today, Khalil Farabee said, quote, yesterday I said he was executed. This autopsy report shows me that was correct. It's obvious he was trying to get away. It's obvious and they're going to shoot him in the back of the head? End quote. These killer cops. I'm telling you. These killer cops. They are doing this daily. Daily. And only a few of these shootings, these executions, are even getting any attention. You know there are others going on in the United States. This is happening every single minute of the day. Every day. It's become, as I said, so passe now. That's how sick our world is, this society. And how violent it is, how oppressive it is to black people. Shot five times by police and in the back of the head, one of those shots... And the family hasn't even been allowed to see the full video from the body camera. This is in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Elizabeth City, North Carolina. We, we barely had time to process Makia Bryant last week. We've barely had time to look back at Dante Wright from a couple of weeks ago now. We've barely had time. To take in that horrible killing of Adam Toledo. He's 13 years old. We've barely had time. And there's others I just told you about the other brother. Isaiah from um, Virginia. Holding Holding a cell phone. I mean, again, it doesn't matter whether someone black has something in their hands or whether they don't. Whether it's a whether it's some weapon or whether it's a phone, whether it's a wallet in Amadou Diallo's case where he got shot 41 times, whether it, whatever, whether it's nothing, it doesn't matter. I f- I'm fed up with this armed, unarmed garbage. Because no one ever says anything about unarmed white people. And they're walking the streets with AR-15s and open carry. They've got swords and axes that they're charging at cops with. 
And the cop never pulls out their gun and shoots them. Doesn't even taser them. In the vast majority of situations, not even taser them. They don't mistake what those people are coming at them with. Oh, I thought he had a Mars bar, a Snickers bar, a star, a bit of Starburst. Oh, and I took out my tape. I thought he had an axe, and in fact he did, but I didn't take out my gun or my taser. I'm telling you, this is what's going on in this country. The question is, will people open their eyes? You've got Amber Geiger now on appeal. She's trying to appeal that sentence. Remember I kept telling you recently, dear listener, about Amber Geiger, who shot and killed, executed Botham Jean in his own apartment in Dallas, Texas? Do you not remember that, dear listener? And I told you, as you may remember, that she got a 10-year sentence, a 10-year sentence in her sentencing that one of the witnesses who testified against her was like 19 or 20. His name, I believe, was Andrew or Joshua or whatever. He got murdered with a bullet in his mouth. I wonder what that means. I wonder what that's supposed to mean. You talk, you get killed. Hello. That's what that's about, right? Testified against her. He ends up getting murdered. Now, she is probably not going to serve... And I told you, I don't think she's going to serve five years in prison of that lousy-ass 10-year sentence for murdering a man in his own apartment. Oh, I mistook my... You mistake a lot of fucking things, don't you? How come these white cops are always mistaking something when it comes to black people? Ooh, I thought, this is my apartment. Ooh, even though the blooming doormat was different from what yours was. Oh, I thought that this was my apartment. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought. Oh, he had a gun. Oh, he's got a gun to his head. Never thinking that a black person is capable of speaking into a cordless phone. Oh, oh, he had something. It magically appeared at the steering wheel. And so I shot Andrew Brown Jr. at least eight times, at least five times and once in the back of the head because he had a gun at the back of his head because there was a gun pointing from his head out to me. So I shot him in the back of the head. Jesus Christ. That's the kind of absurdity. I know that last part is not what someone said, but that's the absurdity that there are people in this country who will find and make up excuses to justify murdering black people. And that report that I talked about, that 188-page report that talks about this being a crime against humanity, that report should be getting airtime in much more prominent places than this one. the nerve of these folks and then you want to board up places you want ooh state of emergency the state of emergency is you you're the emergency my god you're shooting us dead every day you're the emergency but you board up the town ooh oh the verdict's coming we've got to board up everything That's the way we live in this country? That is not a healthy way to live. And you're the violent system that's perpetuating all of this. You're perpetrating all of this violence. And then it's all this lockdown incarceration mentality after you commit these executions of us. And then tell us to stay calm. This is a really sick, psychopathic and sociopathic way to operate. Amber Geiger is is now, oh, she's now trying to appeal. I told you she was going to try to, didn't I not tell you that this is going to come? Texas court's going to hear the appeal. Texas court, that's where it happened, Texas. I mean, she's going to, let me tell you something. I think that judge is absolutely going to give her, a, a well, I've been wrong before and I hope to be wrong again. But I'm telling you, I think that she's totally she's totally going to get nothing. I, I mean, really, I, I yeah, I, I, come on now. 
And it just kind of really eats me up here because it just really, you know what? It really vexed me, I have to tell you. And look, I'm not a member of the Botham Jean family. It just vexed me to see the brother of Botham Jean hugging the murderer who took her his brother's life. You know, I get it. Some people are God-fearing Christians and they're forgiving. I'm a Christian. Um, I believe in, in a higher power. I am not a very religious person at all because I don't like religion because it causes so much damage and bloodshed and oppression in this world. And don't believe me as someone just said, I'm not just saying that. The history backs me. And you just have to open your eyes and do a little bit of research. No, not Wikipedia, but just do basic reading that will tell you in two seconds about the bloody history that religion has and what it's done to billions of people. But I was so vexed last year, when, or two years ago now, when the brother, I mean, I guess that shows you what kind of grace he has, but I'm fed up of this characterization of us. When we get killed in these streets, when our family members get murdered, ooh, the appraisal of the way we react to that. Oh, they have such grace. Oh, they have such... Like you're fucking talking about some fucking athlete, you know? Oh, he has such dignity and, oh, such indomitable will and spirit, doesn't she? She has this will. Don't they just have this indomitable spirit that allows them to continue despite their injury? And he kept going and he got to the finish line of that 100-meter dash. That's how we're compared. When we lose family members, we're evaluated as to our dignity and our calm. You can almost see the five judges putting their scorecards up right now, couldn't you? 9.9, 9.8, 9.9, 10.10. 10. Like at the Bloomin' Winter Olympics. That's how it is. It's so evil, isn't that? So disgusting that our grief is being evaluated, how we react to a system that murders our kids. That's being evaluated. I mean, I'm evaluating it too when I say that I am, I really didn't like that. And I just don't like it that we as black folks, some of us do this. We can be, some of us, a very forgiving people. You know, we hug the murderers of our kids. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, that, listen, no, nah, uh, not me. Someone takes a family member from me, I'm not hugging them. Shit. To borrow a line from uh, Mr. Whitlock, I think he can do it a whole lot better than I. Shit. Nah, I'm not hugging Jack. You know, I'm not doing any of that foolishness. Sorry, but I'm, it's just, I'm not going there. She's going to be out and I'm telling you, will he be hugging her then? I'm sorry to be attacking him like this because it's not appropriate. Is he going to, uh, is he going to be hugging her when she gets out of prison, say next year, say this year for good behavior and she wins her appeal if she wins her appeal? Is he going to be hugging her then? Is he going to be waiting for her outside the uh, the jail? <sighs> ah, yeah, again, eh, you know. And there she is. She's today or tomorrow. She's going to be in front of a Texas court appealing her sentence. She's. I'm telling you. And do you think that the Texas court is going to say no to a white woman? Do you think it's going to happen? I'm just going to read a snippet of this. Here's the here's the story, right? Um Yeah, the arguments are being heard right now. Panel of judges. Ten years in prison for murder, right? (sighs) 
she's gonna. It was reasonable. The appeal that she's making is it's re. It, you know, she's her her point is it was reasonable for her to mistake. Everybody's mistaken us for somebody else or something else, or our or our freaking cell phones become guns to white people, you know, with guns and badges. Jesus Christ! So now she's arguing that oh, oh, I thought it was my own apartment, and it's reasonable for me to confuse my apartment that I've been living at for a certain amount of years with this black person's. So it entitles me to go and shoot them. You all make up any motherfucking rationalization to murder one of us, don't you now? Don't you now? And this racist ass system is going to go for it. Because that's what the system does. It allows this shit in the first place. And yes, I am cursing. Because I'm not going to sit here and be nice and happy about all of this. When I've got Andrew Brown Jr. shot five times, including in the back of the head. When he has his hands on the steering wheel. Give me a break. Guy in another in Virginia last week. Shot 10 times. He's in ICU. It's a miracle he's not dead. I hope he pulls through. He had a cordless phone in his hand. Oh, God, please. You know, and Jacob Brown, Jacob Blake Jr. Shot eight times in the back at close range. Paralyzed for the rest of his life. And that cop who did that. Oh, he's back on the fourth. Back on duty. <laughs> like nothing happened. No, I'm sorry. That this, no, I'm not going to be here. Sitting here giving you sanguine. Sanguine, sanguine, sanguine sounds. When people are being killed. My people are being killed. And I would feel the same way if this was happening to anybody else. Brown people. Native. White. Anybody. But it's only happening really to brown people and black people. In abundance. This is just so evil, man. It's just so evil. And we can't turn and pretend that this ain't happening. It's like what Trayvon Free said the other day at the Oscars. Which is why I played that clip in yesterday's episode. Do not be indifferent to our pain. Because there's something wrong with you if you are. And people who are, said James Baldwin, really are the kinds of people who generate, for me, my, my greatest outrage. If you are indifferent, you're the problem. I mean, even the people who have absolute contempt for us make that clear enough, as horrifying and as evil as that is. That's hardly indifferent. They're just announcing to you that they don't give a fuck. But as it regards this situation or any other, indifference, well, that's arguably a bigger killer. Thank you very much for listening to this edition. And by the way, the CDC is now issuing new guidelines on mask wearing for those who are vaccinated. I'll get to that tomorrow. To this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. <laughs>